Let's face it, hiring help is not easy these days. Let Zentegra Staffing help you find the right person for the right job. Head over to Zentegra.com forward slash Zentegra Staffing to find out more and let us staff your people needs. Welcome to another Citrix Session with your host, Andy Whiteside and Bill Sutton, your source for all things Citrix. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 31 of the Citrix Session. My name is Andy Whiteside. I'm the host. I've got with me Bill Sutton, who's the Director of Services at Integra. Bill, how's it going? Uh, It's going really well, Andy. You know, I, I, I probably should ask you beforehand, I'm doing this from a phone because I'm recording the uh, the um, Ring Central meeting from my virtual desktop. I think it's the first time I've done that um, because I'm kind of in between devices here. How, how do I sound? Sound fine. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Well, Bill, we have with us uh, Kurt Romer for part two of the Are You Working Securely or Working Remotely uh, blog series that he had. Kurt, how's it going? Great, Andy. And uh, hi, Bill. Hi. I think uh, the first uh, episode that we did was kind of interesting, right? We really – that was more about provoking people to think differently. What are we going to cover this time, Kurt? Well, I think we can expand on that and uh, really get into some additional situations where people can better protect sensitive data as they're working from home. Um, you know, Give them some of the tools and, and some of the thought processes to really make the situation uh, a competitive advantage. I think one of the uh, – Things we talked about in the first one early on in that podcast, which caught me off guard, was the idea that uh, you know if you're really smart about this, these go-to meetings and these zooms and these ring central meetings and you name it, uh, you dial in, right? Like here's here's here, here Bill R and I again. We've got our webcams on. You can see our background. You can learn all about my office here. Uh, yet, Kurt, you're you're dialed in on the phone again, in, incognito on us. I'm dialed in. Uh... I understand this to be a podcast. I would have gone on the web, but I would have had a more interesting background. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like the play that you're just being more secure. So do I. <laughs> All right. So um, let me see. Uh, so let's start off with tip number one and go into a little detail here. It says, uh, know what your employees are working with. What are you covering there, Kurt? When you take a look at uh, – people working from home oftentimes are bringing home uh, sensitive data. And when they walked out of the office, many times they brought their corporate system home with them, as well as probably some folders and other things. Organizations might not have been too concerned about what people were working with when they were in the office because you knew that system was never going to leave. You knew the papers weren't going to leave. If you were in a very sensitive uh, type of workplace, people were inspected as they arrived and as they they left the office. Well, when people went to work from home after the, the COVID event was declared, you now have sensitive data that's really being distributed to everybody's home. And that pile of sensitive data is only building, whether it's Uh, printed materials or whether it's information that's on a corporate laptop or desktop or uh, even a personal system sitting right in front of someone. So uh, managers in particular really need to go back through and interview uh, their employees to see what sensitive data they're working with and make sure that uh, compliance and contractual objections or obligations are, are being taken care of. I love how you said you're a splurge and buy a Chromebook. Those things don't typically go together, but, you know, a lot of the Chromebooks, uh, when you say splurge and buy a cheap Chromebook, that is a really cost-effective way to, you know, make sure they're using a a new device, a clean device, and a device that, in theory, can't really have that much uh, sensitive data on it or at least that many different ways to exploit it. Yeah, the, the Chromebook's nice because it's a fresh environment every time. It keeps itself up to date. You you don't have all these other applications that are installed on there in many cases, and uh, you can make sure that people are utilizing that, they understand they're working with sensitive data. It's like having a watermark on the screen. The watermark's not just there to keep people from stealing the data. 
it's to remind employees, hey, within this application, I'm working with something sensitive. I should pay a little bit more attention. And you know, if you had a cheap Chromebook, you deter people from being able to do personal and work on the, the same device in many cases. They might go to the Chromebook knowing that, hey, if I'm, I'm working with sensitive things, I'm going to do it from this Chromebook. And uh, it also, in many cases, helps us be a lot more portable when we've got something small and light like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm actually doing this uh, session, as I said, from my virtual desktop, and I'm using a Neverware, which is a software conversion of a Chrome OS. Um, Kurt, question for you. How, um, how many exploits, what percentage of exploits do I eliminate by not using Windows, the Windows operating system, and specifically in this case on the endpoint, but is there a number out there that that gives me kind of a, a threshold of how much I tighten down my security vector just by not using Windows? It would be interesting to go through and run the numbers on that, Andy. And, uh, you know, the information is definitely publicly available, but uh, there are a lot of Windows exploits. Windows is a very highly used and therefore very highly targeted operating system by the attackers. And you see a lot of times with ransomware, it's installing EXEs, it's installing DLLs, and uh, maybe even using PowerShell in some cases. And those, of course, don't impact a, uh, a Chromebook. Those are not vectors that work on there. So it's not that Chromebooks or other devices are immune to being attacked. Uh, they're still constantly updated as new new security threats emerge and uh, new vulnerabilities. But um, yeah, Windows is very much a, a predominant operating system and has a lion's share. One thing that contributes to Windows and one thing I, I definitely remind people of uh, quite often is don't run as local admin. If you're logging in every morning as your local admin, anything that you click on has administrative privileges. So you've got to be really careful with that. You're just making it so much easier for the attackers and malware. Set up a separate account that's restricted, doesn't have access to system files, and uh, forces you to go through and actually authenticate when you want to do an update. It'll uh, keep a lot of the, the more security malware off your device. Yeah, that's step number one, which I think we talked about last week, that just a lot of people, just by nature, just they just don't do it. And let's give Microsoft a lot of credit, right? Windows 10 is infinitely more secure than Windows 7 was. And Windows 7, they came out with user access control. I think it was Windows 7. Um, you know, a lot of things, they've worked on a lot of. They just happen to be the one that's got the most use cases, therefore the one most likely to be attacked. <laughs> They do, but yes, as you said, Microsoft with Defender, Defender ATP, and a, a lot of other services that they're building into both Windows 10 as well as Azure are providing for some really great security outcomes. Uh, many organizations haven't turned them on, though. They're just using the basics today. And uh, if you're working with sensitive data, go back through and look at what Microsoft offers from a security portfolio. I think you'll be very impressed. But there are oftentimes additional things to install and configure. So I think your message here, though, is just use something that's just less attacked and probably has bugs in it and security issues, too, but, you know, just mitigate the, the attack. Or you don't, don't live in a bad neighborhood. That's step number one to not getting your house broken into. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Your attack surface. Yeah. Hey, Bill, thoughts on this topic? No, I just think this is, uh, this is you know, if you, you read this, I think this is critically important and probably something that was largely um, ignored, maybe not ignored, but at least not considered as significantly when folks started going home back in the middle of March. I think it was get everybody home and get them working and we'll worry about the security and what they're working on, you know, next. And that's, uh, that's kind of back the backwards way of doing it. I think some folks were forced into it, but I think uh, a lot of companies have learned a lot from this and, and we'll see a lot more consideration of these types of things going forward. Yeah, I just put up an article for you guys. Somebody from iGel, who's another you know Linux-based operating system that's going to reduce your your attack vector. They were they posted something about uh, Chrome and the number of vulnerabilities that have yeah. been identified lately. It's you know you, the truth is all of it's written by human beings, and there's exploits. It's just a matter of what can you do to mitigate it in various steps and phases. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I like iGel as well uh, considerably as a solution, particularly being able to boot off USB is uh, just really worked out well for a lot of organizations and is a administrative tool of, of choice for uh, many organizations as well. All right. 
Well, and Kurt, I think what we're really saying there is having Linux under the core of what, at the core, not under, but at the core of what we're working with probably, you know, just eliminates a lot of areas of exposure and risk. It does, uh, especially when it's security hardened. And, um, you know, Windows can be security hardened as well. Uh, people have been able to do that. But, uh, you know, these particular Linux distros um, ship security hardened and have had a pretty decent track record. Yep. And then the flip side of that, though, is we do need Windows to get things done. That's, you know, Citrix story, at least for me, from 1999 is, you know, let's use whatever we want, ideally something pretty secure on the endpoint, but let's make it functional by putting Windows in a you know, trusted, trust but verified uh, location on our network. Yeah, and also being able to go through and publish individual applications and wrap the security policies around those. So you're controlling the clipboard and peripherals and where you can save and what the application can interact with. You know, there's a, a lot of facilities that Citrix provides that extends capabilities within Windows. And um, you know that helps tremendously as well from a, a sensitive data and a privacy perspective when you're just pushing the pixels down to the endpoint. And you've got you know what I've called a few times a, a pixel air gap firewall to make sure that you're not actually sending the sensitive apps and sensitive data down to the endpoint or sending private information from somebody's personal workstation uh, back up to the corporate data center. So, Kurt, I have a question for you on that. How, how much of your time do you spend talking to security organizations like partners like us or customers who want to talk to you about security where, you know, these concepts of the, uh, you know, the pixel air gap you just mentioned are, are foreign to them uh, versus, you know, the idea of, you know, VPNs and you know, network level security. I, I personally struggle. I, I'm working with a couple of security vendors now or security partners of ours who have socks, you know, these, uh, these security operating centers and uh, I keep having Citrix conversations with them and it's like it just it just bounces right off of them and they go right back to talking about you know your traditional security plays antivirus uh, intrusion protection um, you know anomalies they see on the network and not how to just deliver securely yeah, people tend to gravitate towards a lot of the security technologies that they're familiar with, and um, you know that that can be good, but especially when the model completely changes and what you're looking to deliver, how you're looking to deliver it, and the use cases back behind it have wildly changed, and in often cases are in complete contrast to the policies that you publish. It's time to step back and say, how can we do this differently so that we're achieving the right security, privacy, compliance outcomes. And um, this is where we need to look beyond the VPN. You know, VPNs are great for connecting trusted nodes to trusted networks and connecting trusted networks to each other. But for a general purpose remote access, particularly for BYOD, wow, I'm, I've got a lot of concerns with VPNs. Um, and it's why you've got to look at the, the four different ways of deploying resources, going direct, uh, going through some level of proxy or API, being able to go through virtualization or go through containerization and enclaving, and be able to dynamically pick those at the point of request so that you're getting the right outcomes. You know, your VPN is just going to get you on the network. How do you actually control usage beyond that? How do you make sure that your sensitive data is not being over distributed and how do you make sure that you're providing for bi-directional privacy you know those are things that Citrix brings to the table and and my ultimate you know use case or desire is just to start off with delivery of everything don't deploy anything don't get full access to it and you know let the let the business tell you what it needs beyond that and hopefully get away with just a lot of delivery you know, I use the uh, VHS versus DVD versus Netflix streaming model as the example, um, you, know, you, you want to get to a point where people demand, they want the streaming, they don't want the delivered, uh, deployed world anymore. Yeah, it almost sounded like you were talking about zero trust there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> zero choice, zero trust with convenience. Okay, so let's uh, let's move to the second one, which you know we talked about Windows and and, and Microsoft Windows, uh, and we talked about uh, how widely used it is and the challenges that causes for Microsoft. And it's not a bad code; it's just the the use case and the ability to to attack what a lot of people use. Uh, now we get to that new world, which has probably been around for me since I guess '96 or so when Internet Explorer six 
came out, um, the browser, right? The browser became a big platform for applications and then a whole new world of uh-oh showed up at the same time. Yeah, it sure did. Uh, looking back at somebody who watched some of the first browsers come out and be available, it's just amazing to see that this piece of technology that was one of the most insecure applications ever written in several cases is now just paramount to security as you connect up to the cloud and SaaS and web-based applications. And yet many people are still using the same browser that is over configured to do absolutely everything and um, is overexposing them because of that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what, what, okay, so maybe you don't want to answer this because that's your, your nature. You know, what do you use? I mean, you, you, you got your Mozilla fans out there. You've got your, you know, your Chrome fans. You've got now Edge fans, which I, you know, find interesting and, and start, I'm starting to embrace it some myself. Does it matter? I, it, it does matter. Um, you should definitely use the browser that's going to give you the best experience. And I use several. I've got several different hosted browsers. I've got the secure remote browser available to me. Um, local browsers, I will harden down and oftentimes uh, you know, go to join a call and somebody will be, oh, we need you on video. And it's kind of a, hey, I should have known that ahead of time because I've got my browser configured to not allow the webcam uh, to be on or maybe even not allow the microphone to be on. And so it's about going through and configuring your browser for least privilege and um, hardening it. And then when you've got uh, very sensitive use cases, being able to complement that with other browsers. So Microsoft has the ability to um, provide for additional browsing within Edge that can be sandboxed from other browser sessions and sandboxed further than, uh, than it's been in the past with some of the Java and JavaScript tricks. Um, you've got the ability to run browsers hosted in the data center, hosted out in the cloud, one-time use browsers. Um, it's time to really revisit the enterprise browser strategy to look at it as more than just the browser that's embedded with the OS and look at how do you deliver the best productivity and security experience uh, for browser-based applications and deliver that dynamically. Yeah. So, so let's let's make sure I understand the Citrix story as it stands today, right? So there's there's um, your local browser that's in, that's installed in your operating system. There's um, the ability to have um, you know a browser that's published as an application you know, delivered uh, versus via presentation layer. Uh, there's the ability to have that hosted in a cloud somewhere like um, like uh, on a Linux box, and then there's the ability to run the sandboxed browser that. It's part of um, the workspace app. Is that is at a high level? Are those the four plays within the Citrix story today? Uh, those are. So you also have uh, browser as a service, which um, typically people who are running the browser from the cloud are running uh, browser as a service. And, that, and that's a hardened reboot to a gold image Linux box running some version of Chromium. Uh, can be. It can be a native cloud service built in with uh, Citrix Cloud as well and, uh, and or published data center applications. So you really have the complete flexibility to run whichever browser you want and be able to host it wherever you want, plus a native service from Citrix and the Workspace app that would uh, give you a local experience, but with a sandbox containerized browser. And, and what, are the, what are the key scenarios that I can use to decide on the fly which one of those gets used beyond the user just clicking on the icon that represents one of those? Uh, great question. I'll, I'll give you a couple of use cases uh, behind that. So one of the big use cases that we see is people are concerned about arbitrary links. Maybe they're in email, maybe they're in social media. Uh, you know, they have to monitor social media accounts as part of their job. You know, Typically today, if they were running the embedded browser in the OS, if you clicked on an arbitrary link, that could lead you to ransomware. 
what if instead you took any arbitrary link and just launched it in a browser service that's out in the cloud somewhere, it's one time use, it's not connected to the endpoint or to the networks or to any other application. And yep, you clicked on ransomware, but uh, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't cause an event, it didn't cause a breach. So that's, that's one big use case and handling arbitrary links and putting those out in the browser service. The other one is um, we see many organizations that have turned on split tunneling with their VPN because performance for web meetings, things like Zoom, WebEx, Ring Central, GoToMeeting, you know, any of the host of others, the performance is bad if you're hairpinning through the data center. So you can kick off um, any of those through the Workspace app a browser and be able to have a local experience while still having that browser session sandboxed from everything else that's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting case. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of that one. So you're saying if I, if I've got a, if I've got a, uh, an end user that's, that's within a virtual desktop um, and they click a link that, uh, that really needs to run locally, we can redirect that to the local um, workspace browser. Is that what I heard? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. interesting. And with security policies associated with that. So sure. definitely an evolving use case, some interesting things that can be done there. You know, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It's why stepping back and saying, hey, the browsers become really important. Um, if we were to redesign our enterprise browser strategy, what would it look like and why? Right, exactly. And Kurt, all that is uh, controllable by the mothership when using workspace as a service, right? Yes, it is. Now, do I have to be using the service in order to take advantage of all that? Um, no, there are <laughs> definitely some uh, features that are available in CVAD versus the service, and uh, it warrants uh, an investigation of what features are available where, but um, uh, you don't have to be using the service if you're just an on-premises customer, and you can still take advantage of a lot of what I just talked about. Yeah. Yeah, I hate to move on from the browser conversation, but we will take the rest of the day if we don't. Bill, before I do that, though, is there any other comments you wanted on? Because that's that's a whole that's a whole book right there. Talk about that is browsers. a whole book. That is a whole book, and you know we could we could go on forever. So I'll just pause on that and let's move forward. Kurt, was there anything in that section that we didn't cover that you want to make sure we highlight? Oh, I, I will give the last one. I'll just throw it out there for you. Don't click on stuff that you don't know where it goes or don't have an idea where it's going. Just don't click on it. Yeah, everybody's being told that. And we've all seen, uh, you know, the posters associated with that. And in some ways, the education is great and awareness is great. But if your only firewall is somebody clicking the button on that mouse, uh, you really need to rethink what security means to your organization because that's just going to wind up happening. You don't want the next data breach to be from somebody's living room. It's just not a good idea. Yeah. So um, talk about some solutions that can get you beyond just telling people not to click. Yeah, yeah, that that wouldn't doesn't even work for me, right? Occasionally, I click on something by accident or in a hurry, and I'm like, oh, dang, I didn't know where that was going to go. Or and sometimes it's my own team testing to see what what idiots might click on, including me. All right, uh, next topic is the VPN. We touched on that one earlier, but uh, obviously VPN is one that's been around for a long time. I'll, I'll never forget the first time I got to use one and thought it was awesome. I'll, I have probably I want to say that at the time I even thought, hey, this is a little this is a little open. Uh, since I can get to everything in the company now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been around a while and, and never made 100% sense from a security perspective, and it needs to come to an end. Yeah. It, um, it makes sense if you've got very, very trusted resources. So if you're in the enterprise security model and you're going to be remaining there, every employee is completely vetted, uh, every machine is run by corporate, every network, every application, um, you know, the VPN could still make some level of sense. Uh, I don't run into those organizations anymore. Pretty much everybody is having some level of personal devices. They've got third parties that need to connect to their network. They've got applications that are out in the web or the cloud. Uh, you've got to be able to handle those through different means. And so, you know, VPN is, is a tool. It's got its place uh, of use. Um, one of the big concerns with it right now is that if you're on a VPN, 
you're mm -hmm. sending applications and data down to the endpoint. And uh, I just wrote an article along with uh, Peter Lefkowitz on the sensitive data pandemic and how all of this sensitive data being distributed out to everybody's home is definitely a pandemic waiting to happen. And some of the things that we need to do to uh, get control around that from an IT and compliance perspective. Yeah, you. Uh, I, I hate to even admit it, but my first thought, you know, <laughs> goes to the idea that that uh, this could be a conspiracy theory to to get all this stuff distributed, and then all of a sudden you could be taken advantage of. Which I 100% know that's not what's happened here. But at the same time, from an IT security guy's perspective, uh, man, it sure does. It sure is lining up that way, based on you know, the conversation you just had there, where all this data that was somewhat secured, somewhat secured, is now living at the edge, whether you, the end user, know it, uh, or whether your system knows it and it's, you know, just, it's doing it for you, unbeknownst to you. Yes. All right. And, um, you know, as mentioned, it also gives people the, uh, the ability to hoard data for whatever reason. If they're concerned about their internet going down or being offline, or they're concerned about their employment, uh, and they want to be able to hoard data locally, they can very easily do that with the VPN. Uh, second point I'd make is you talked a little bit about conspiracy theory. We should set up a separate podcast and get some uh, get some good uh, good presenters to give our, our favorite conspiracy theories. That'd be a fun one. <laughs> yeah, and I'll I'll put that one in Pete Downing's bucket. That sounds like something he would he would love to do. That would be perfect for Pete. Yeah, I'll, I will connect him to you after this and ask y'all to set that up. I think that would be uh, interesting and entertaining. <clears throat> might, might have a whole new good IT there. conspiracy theories. Yeah, <laughs> all the time, right? Hey, Bill, your thoughts on the VPN concept and what we've yeah. covered here and your your history of seeing it, its life cycle? Yeah, I, I um, yeah, we've talked about this a couple of times, and I think one thing you said, Kurt, about uh, – exfiltrating the data, uh, users pulling the data onto, onto their local machine and being able to pull all that data down. I, that's definitely the, the case, of course, but I also look at it the other way, and that is what data may be exploiting the connection or the route tables uh, from that endpoint to get back up into the corporate network. Uh, and that's where our real, that's obviously where our real risk is, is some home user using a VPN and they've got some worm on their machine. I've, I've seen it happen back in the day, probably back in the early 2000s or the late 90s. Customers that embraced VPNs and only to find that that antivirus on the on the CEO's home computer um, wasn't really working well, and they ended up with a problem in their network because of the VPN. So, uh, to your point, uh, to your point, uh, it's it's tough to find one that's really well well designed and locked down. Uh, but I, I think the you know the the exfiltration of data is certainly a, a concern. But obviously the the movement of that of, of data and bits from the endpoint into the network is equally, if not more, of a concern. Yeah, uh, great great point, Bill. And uh, you know we all know antivirus is necessary but insufficient. And yes. if you step back and you say, hey, I've I've got somebody like the CEO who needs to be on the VPN. What security controls would you need to install on their endpoint? How many agents would you have to have before you'd feel comfortable with that? Right. And wouldn't it just make more sense to keep the sensitive apps and data off of that endpoint in the first place? Absolutely. I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about a little, a few minutes ago, and that is uh, the concept of centralizing the data and the fact that a lot of security consultants today that we've run into, I know in particular, don't really understand that conceptually. My hope is that given what we've what we've experienced in the past two months, as well as the the increasing prevalence of things like Windows Virtual Desktops and folks being more interested in that concept will help uh, will help us be able to deliver these kind of solutions more frequently to enhance security, but also to enhance uh, work from home and other efforts. Yep, very true. All right, so tip number four, uh, Kurt, you've got here, help them create backup plans. What do you mean? Well, things go wrong. 
and uh, if your network goes down, do you know how to turn on a personal hotspot to be able to continue that conversation with a critical customer or to be able to continue that web, webcast or podcast? Uh, you know, many people don't know that they've got a backup network in their, their pocket, and uh, especially with the carriers turning off a, a lot of the data caps right now uh, to be able to help people during the pandemic. It's a good time for people to say, hey, here's how to turn on my uh, my personal hotspot so that I can have some continuity of operation. Uh, you need to make sure you've got network at all points in time. The other one is, what if your endpoint suddenly dies? What if it gets dropped? What if it gets something spilled on it? What if uh, you know a pet chews it up or it just gets bricked? Um, what are you going to do? Are you going to be down for three weeks while you wait for IT to configure a new one to you and ship it out? Or can you just, like we talked about before, be able to boot off an iGel stick or be able to uh, boot off of Chrome OS or have some other way to, to get up and running very quickly and get right back to where you were? Right. What's the reality of that? Do you think that people are going to... I mean, they're lucky to get one functioning solution and get it in place and users trained. I, I love what you're talking about. I, I do, and obviously, I, I live that world. I must have ten different ways to work with my within my office in my house. Um, I just don't know how realistic one that is. Realistic that this one is. It's something that needs to be very realistic. You know, we talked about ransomware before. What if somebody got in? targeted your call center and took down every single one of your call center reps in their homes, bricked their PCs, had all of their personal data, plus all the corporate data that's on that system encrypted, and they're going to leak it out to the internet. And um, now you tell everybody to turn those PCs off. So not only did you potentially lose a whole bunch of sensitive data, but you've also completely lost the productivity of your call center. What are you going to do? And what I'm saying is this is something organizations need to plan for ahead of time. And if you're, even if you're an individual consultant, you know, you need to make sure that you've got a great backup plan that if uh, you lose a device, you lose network, you lose your data, you've got a way to get it back right away. And you've, uh, you've tested this and you run back and forth between those models every week so that you know what to do. You're prepared. You're part of the shared responsibility model. Well, I think the challenge for me in that comment was that I think Citrix and I think Deliver first, and then I'm thinking, okay, what's my backup plan from that? That gets more complicated. Uh, but at the very least, if you're thinking Citrix or Deliver Technologies uh, as um, as a backup plan, um, that that's pretty easy. Okay, your 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 Wi-Fi at home's down. Go to the Starbucks or wherever, um, and just remote into your Citrix uh, session and. Boom, you're back up and working. Yep, very true. And we need to extend that out as well for organizations that are running primarily on premises right now. Now's the time for you to be exploring cloud and get resources up to the cloud so that as hurricane season hits or as there's any regional events, you've got the ability to continue operations without people having to drive into an office. Right. Hey, Bill, thoughts on this one? Uh, not really. I mean, you know, I, I can bring up an example or two from years ago. It doesn't really, doesn't really reflect home users, but um, we had a client that had multiple remote offices, retail offices, and they use thin clients. And there's always the concern of what if the front front clerk front desk clerk's thin client burns up or goes south or what have you. And we put two or three in the in the uh, closet in the uh, at each location where they could swap them out. All they do is match up colors. We'll be right back in business with the central delivery mechanism. So I understand the need for this. It is a challenge, particularly with home users, but I think I'm with Kurt here. I think uh, customers need to be aware of it. Yeah, at least, at least need to know that you've presented that option and they've said no, right? That's right. Yeah, okay. All right, Kurt, that, uh, that kind of gets us to the end of those. Any of those four that uh, you want to kind of go back through and highlight anything that we didn't cover that you think is essential that people do know? I think one of the big things is from a, an individual perspective, if you're not getting this information from your employer, get out and ask them about it because uh, oftentimes they may not be thinking uh, 
how much work from home is is completely changed the security model for you as an individual and uh, get back to helping the manager to understand what sensitive data the employee is working with. Make sure the organization knows. And from an organization perspective, also be able to turn on analytics to see what people are working with, see what apps they're utilizing, see how they're they're working with them and look at it not just as access events, but look at it across life cycle usage and be able to see how the sensitive data is being used and in particular where it's being distributed to so that you can rein that in as you need to uh, so that you can still prove compliance. Hey, Kurt, I got one for you. Um, with the way you think, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> uh, some nights are a challenge. I wake up and think about new things and have to write them down uh, just to make sure that um, you know we can be best prepared. And that's really it. It's, it's about being prepared. It's about being resilient. And it's about having a plan. And new things come up all the time. Um, you need to get a plan for them very quickly. Is it, uh, so let me tell you a story real quick. So right now I've got my house, right? And I could tell you right now if the alarm's on, the doors are locked, uh, and if they're not, I could do it remotely. Is that better today that I can do all that or is it worse in your mind? Uh, it's better that you can do all of that. It would be really bad if somebody else could do all of that. Right. Well, of course they can't, can they? Or can they? <laughs> Uh, if that system is exposed to the internet or if it's using outdated Bluetooth or something that's got vulnerabilities in it, there's a good possibility they can. So, so it sounds like you're saying I should turn off Bluetooth and disconnect it from the internet. <laughs> uh, definitely stay on top of any of the vulnerabilities. You know, if that solution is giving you utility that you otherwise wouldn't have, that's fantastic. But um, you want to make sure that you're not uh, exposing yourself at the same point in time. It's like the old adage, Andy. It's like the old adage they used to say a few years ago back in the Windows XP or even Windows 98 days. You want to secure a device, unplug it or disconnect it from any network. <laughs> Yeah, I think that ship sailed, but that uh, oh, yeah. still makes for a good joke, and uh, it's, it does. it's still true. <laughs> it's still true. Uh, that's why I see a lot of organizations that you know they for their really secure systems they are closed loop. They don't even they don't let them get out. That's right. All right, guys. Well, Kurt, I appreciate it again, and uh, we'll keep an eye on your blog series. And the next thing you come out with, we'll we'll ping you, and I'll I'll get with Pete right now and ask him to uh, to try to set up some time with you to do a re recording of a conspiracy theories around IT and security specifically. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, with that, I guess we'll wrap up another session. Bill, anything uh, going on in your world you want to make sure people know about? Not at this time. I think in my world, uh, I know we've got a bunch of events scheduled, a bunch of education events for customers. Uh, our vendors can share that. That'd be great. Um, at the same time, it's kind of a, it's a weird world, right? We put so much effort into getting people to uh, Citrix Synergy and, and VMworld and other big conferences that uh, not having that to promote and talk about this year is that's odd. But uh, it'll be back, and we'll we'll all be back at uh, you know happy hours and um, and uh, what that? the expo hall kickoff. Uh, before too long, I hope. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Citrix Session with your hosts, Andy Whiteside and Bill Sutton. A special thanks to our guests, podcast produced by Pete Downing. Head over to Zentegra.com forward slash podcast to listen to all podcasts in this series.